This meeting is now being recorded. All guests have been muted.
Hello, hi, Scott. Oh, my God. He just said, uh, he's, he's muted. Yeah, he's muted. He's muted. He's muted. So unmute them. I think did I did I okay. well let me unmute him alone. Yeah, let me go to his I can unmute uh, I think I can probably un just unmute him. Right? Yeah. What was the name? I did. I don't see it. Go down. Go down. It's cold up. There is no down. Okay, there's there's no arrow, there's nothing. I mean it's just uh hey, uh okay. email him the well, I don't know. Chat I'm gonna chat with everybody. I can chat with him. I'm just unmute everybody. No, just okay. tell you can unmute All them. guests have been unmuted. Hello, Scott. Yes. Okay. Great. Are you? Uh, do you have your your presentation ready? I do. I do. Okay. We're going to go ahead and try to give you. Uh, we're going to share, promote you, and then have you share your screen. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go to your name here, and I'm going to go this, and then I'm going to go promote. And so do I have to do anything? Yeah, did this come anything to did, did, yeah, did anything come up in your screen? I mean I see you doing your thing, but nothing has come up on my screen. I could go should I go up to screen share and do anything up there? Yeah, okay, go up to yeah, go up to screen share and press yeah, there, there you go. There you go. Why is it share? Chrome needs to launch, I'll launch it. Yeah, okay, yeah, go ahead and launch it. Okay, so am I sharing? Uh, not, give it a minute. It, it takes it usually takes a minute or two, so let's just okay. go ahead and wait. Okay. Because right right now it just says uh, we're still waiting, so that, but that's okay. I see. On mine it says it says sharing. Okay, just, just wait. Okay. Yeah, maybe the system's just a little slow. Okay. Oh, I see. Is there a, oh, there, there we go. go. There we go. There you go. Okay. And now you see that? Yes. Yeah. That was the, yep. And okay. can you see my cursor as it moves around? Yes. Yeah, we can okay. see it. Yep. Great. All right. Fantastic. I think you guys are good, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. What is your number? What is my phone number? Yeah, yeah. you're calling from right now. What's the phone number that you're calling on the phone you're calling from? Yeah, I believe it's 510-559-9361. 9361. Okay. Thank you. At least that's, I'm in a conference room and that's the number that's written on the phone, but okay. I, I hope it's the same as, yeah. Okay. Here's, here's what we're going to do, Scott. We're going to put mute, we're going to mute all the participants, but then I'll unmute you alone, okay? Okay. All right, so just hold on for a second and we're going to check this out. Okay. All guests have been muted. Okay, so it told me I'm no longer muted. Okay, yeah, exactly. We can hear you. All right, great. Perfect. And so that, that means that everybody else is muted, though, so there won't be interruptions. Okay. So and then, um, I'm not, I don't know how this usually goes, but all I see is my um, slides. There's nothing, I don't see anyone writing anything in or anything, so is that, is that okay? Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. We don't have to look that. Yeah, we, we have, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll monitor stuff here. Okay, gotcha.
Scott? Yes. Do you want us to monitor the time for you and give you a heads up? Um, I have a big. I, I think I'm. I think I've got it. I've got a big clock in front of me, and so I'll keep my eye on it. Okay, great. Um, but is it the case that at 12:30 this whole thing just shuts down? No, 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 no. Okay. I mean, we want it to, but it doesn't automatically. Stop, stop. Okay. Okay. But, but we, that's when we do want it to stop. But, yes, yes. But it does, it's not like the system will crash or anything. No. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. But I, I will do my best to I, – I've got about 25 tops minutes of talking to do, and so I figure five minutes for questions. That sounds great. Yeah. Yeah, we will start in two minutes. Okay, sounds good. It's about time to start. We'll start. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Office of Information Management and Analysis, OIMA Brown Bank webinar series. I am uh, David Adressa, and my co host is uh, Eric Mark, and our contact information is at the bottom, so you can contact us anytime. We like to remind you that OIMA Brown Bank webinar will be held every month. Next month, it will be on Thursday, April 28th. The webinar will be strictly 30 minutes event for both questions and uh, presentation. Today's seminar is about a recently released tool. This tool is called the Riparian Zone Estimation Tool, in short, RIPZ. 
It is a GIS-based decision support tool that estimates functional riparian width based on the channel type and associated riparian functions. The speaker is Dr. Scott Dastroff. Scott is the lead geomorphologist in the Resilient Landscape Program at SAPI. He currently leads several projects and are developing resilient multi-benefit landscape management approach. So with this brief introduction, I will pass the phone for Scott to start his presentation. So Scott, you can go ahead and start your presentation. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Dawi, and thank you everyone for uh, attending the webinar here. So as Dawi mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about RIPSET, the Riparian Zone Estimation Tool. And I'm going to start out by just giving a high-level overview of the tool, um, why it was developed, uh, what it does. And then I'll conclude by showing you um, some applications of using the tool, so some case studies where we've recently used the tool in uh, the North Bay and also in the North Coast. And then I'll leave some time at the end, I hope, um, to be able to take some questions. So starting out with the overview of RIPSET, its overall purpose. So the purpose of this tool is to help users estimate riparian zone width based on desired function and watershed location. Okay, so we're, we're, we're going away from the idea that riparian is just vegetation next to a channel and getting into this functional width approach. Okay, so, so what does that mean? Well, let's start by looking at this uh, hypothetical uh, cross-section going from a channel uh, through the floodplain to the riparian zone uh, to an upland. So we know that riparian functions change as we move away from channel. So close to the channel, the functions are about uh, bank stability, um, channel shading, large woody debris supply, those types of things. And as we move away from the channel, the riparian functions transition into things like um, surface water filtering, uh, habitat, those types of things. So we wanted to develop a tool that um, enabled the user to have flexibility and come up with a width based on the function of interest. So not only does riparian function change going away from the channel, but it's also quite different um, depending on where you are in a watershed. So um, up here in the headwater zone, riparian functions are really about uh, coarse sediment input, large woody debris input. As you move down gradient and go into this, what I call this mid-watershed or this transport zone, riparian functions transition into things like shading, bank stability, filtering, and then as you move further down into kind of lower gradient alluvial um, reaches, riparian functions transition into things um, more about flood water retention and groundwater storage. So again, we wanted to develop a tool that was flexible enough to allow users to come up with a functional width uh, no matter where they were in a watershed. So then the overall approach uh, for RIPSET is to use an understanding of riparian functioning with appropriate physical parameters to estimate existing and or desired riparian extent, okay? So this is kind of important to, to mention here up front. Um, a user can use RIPSET with existing information to get an understanding of what riparian functioning currently looks like, or the user can put in either historical conditions or some uh, potential restored condition to get an understanding of what functional riparian extent could be. So a few things to, to point out about the tool. First, it's, a, as we already mentioned, a GIS-based desktop planning tool that can be run with readily accessible data. Okay, so the idea here is that users should be able to get the data that, that they need from publicly available sources uh, to run RIPSET. Next, we developed RIPSET using the best available science regarding the controls on functional width. Okay, so this science coming from the literature, but also coming from our technical advisory committee. Okay, we had many um, great riparian scientists from state agencies and academia and regional science agencies help us develop this tool, and they were really instrumental in providing the robust science um, that underpins RIPSET. Um, third, RIPSET uses adaptable parameters that can be updated to reflect local conditions. Okay, so it's important to know that RIPSET um, has uh, parameter values um, that you can, that the user can, you know, kind of out of the box, open up RIPSET and, and hit run and get answers. Um, and I'll talk about those, um, uh, those out of the box parameter values a little bit later. But the important thing to know is that those are just a starting point. The user can feel free to update those parameter values based on uh, the user's knowledge of their site. 
And then finally, it's important to know that RIPSET uses three distinct modules to estimate functional width based on physical setting. And so what I'm going to do here in the next few slides is just walk through each of these three modules and provide a high-level overview on how these modules work. So the first module that RIPSET uses we call the hill slope module. Um, and this module gives a functional width um, that's based on the adjacent hill slope gradient, okay? And this module is really um, geared towards kind of low order, um, high gradient headwater channels um, like you see here on the top right. Um, and so what we have here on the bottom right is kind of a schematic, um, kind of a simple schematic illustrating how this module works. And this is a simplified equation. Uh, so essentially, um, the hill slope module gives um, one meter of functional width for every one percent that the adjacent hill slope angle is above some threshold value. And I'll get into the threshold value a little bit later in the application, um, but that's the overall equation that this module uses. And then the targeted functions, since we're here kind of in, in low order, high gradient channels, targeted functions are a core sediment input and large woody debris input. So the second module that RIPSET uses, uh, we call the vegetation module. Okay, and within this module, functional width is driven by both adjacent hill slope or bank gradient, um, as well as uh, vegetation height. And this module can really be used anywhere within a watershed from kind of high gradient, uh, low order channels all the way down to um, low gradient alluvial channels. And we see the simple equation that this module uses here. Uh, so essentially the functional width that it gives um, is based on this kind of tree height factor and the adjacent bank angle. So essentially, you know, for all intents and purposes, the higher this H value, the wider the functional width. Um, and the targeted functions for this module are really the suite of functions that we typically think about um, for riparian zones, uh, large woody debris input, channel shading, uh, bank stabilization, as well as runoff filtration. Module number three, the hydrologic connectivity, or the HICON module for short. Okay, and so this module gives a functional width based on flooding extent. Okay, and so this is really um, intended to use, for, uh, to use in kind of low gradient alluvial channels with, with broad floodplains. Um, kind of a simple schematic here showing how it works. It gives a functional width based on large flooding extent, and it uses very simple hydraulics. It uses Manning's equation to come up with that that flooding extent, and so basically what it needs is kind of um, channel topography, channel slope, and roughness information to come up with um, flooding extents for channel cross sections. Um, and then the targeted functions here, since we're in kind of low gradient uh, alluvial channels, um, the functions are really uh, about floodwater storage and groundwater recharge. Okay, so it's important to know before I go any further that there's three modules, hill slope module and vegetation module can both be run kind of watershed wide, okay? So a user can put in uh, topographic information and vegetation information for kind of large landscape areas and, and run the tool to get functional width. But this hydrologic connectivity module is more of a reach scale um, module. The user basically picks um, a reach of interest and then the module gives an estimated flooding extent. Okay, so there's a little bit of difference right now in how these how these modules work. So that's the high-level overview of RIPSET, three modules, kind of the basic um, science behind it. So I guess what I'd like to do now um, is just kind of show you some examples of, of what the output looks like. And I'm going to walk through kind of three applications uh, where we've used RIPSET recently in the North Bay and in the North Coast. So the first application was using RIPSET, and in particular the vegetation module only, um, to help with restoration planning, riparian restoration planning in the Santa Rosa Plain. Okay, so this application, uh, you can think of this as um, using RIPSET to come up with existing, existing functional riparian widths for a highly impacted watershed. So uh, top left, here's where we are in the world, Sonoma County. Um, and I think it's important to kind of walk through the variable values and the data sources before getting to the output. So since this is just the vegetation module, uh, we only have to worry about the vegetation module parameters. So that's that H, that tree height value. And so we use two times the mature tree height um, for that H, and that's kind of the, that's the out of the box parameter value for RIPSET. Um, in terms of data sources, uh, for the channel network, uh, we use the Bay Area Aquatic Resources Inventory, or BARI, 
a publicly accessible data source. For topography, we used uh, we used the kind of uh, the coarse USGS 10 meter DEM, and for vegetation, we used CalVeg. Okay, so all readily accessible data. Um, and so then, what we see here on the right is the output for the vegetation module in the Santa Rosa Plain, outlined here in red. Um, the green shows you the vegetation module output. Okay, so that's the output. But what you don't see here is the channel network. So let's turn that on. Okay, so you can see that there's a lot of blue, a lot of channels, and a lot of wetland areas that don't have any green. Okay, so that's an indication of how impacted this watershed is, that there's no functional width estimate for many of these areas because there's just no vegetation there to actually use to run the tool. So what the user can do is generate that vegetation output as a map, and then the user can synthesize that information into summary plots. And so what we see here is one type of summary plot that the user can, can pull together. So what we did is took all the vegetation module output and came up with riparian width classes for, for the percent of total channels that we looked at, okay? So percent total channel length on the y-axis, or excuse me, the x-axis, and then the y-axis are these several riparian width classes that we came up with. So let me just walk through these width classes quickly. Um, up here at the top, so ri functional riparian widths that are essentially greater than 41 meters wide, okay, we can consider those channels to have fully functional riparian areas, okay, maximum number of riparian functions, uh, including habitat, okay. So down on the other end of the spectrum here at the bottom, these, these small width classes, um, kind of functional riparian widths, five meters and less, we're going to call these areas minimally functional. Okay, a small number of riparian functions are met within these areas. So then if we look at what this plot is telling us, okay, out in the Santa Rosa Plain, um, our analysis showed that almost none of the channels have this fully functional riparian zone. Um, only about 15%, so a small percentage, have channels with moderately functional riparian zones. And then the vast majority, nearly 85% of the channels out in the Santa Rosa Plain um, have minimally functional riparian zones. Okay, so um, as we begin to come up with riparian restoration priorities, this is good information to have um, at the outset. So that is application number one. Application number two, then, um, is looking in the Eel River watershed. Okay, so um, this is work that we did for the North Coast Regional Board to help them uh, develop uh, riparian setbacks for protecting beneficial uses. And this can be thought of as an example of looking at existing functional riparian width for a, a very unimpacted watershed. Okay. So let's, let's see what we have here. So again, where we are in the world, um, Humboldt County, variable values. So we, for this application, I'm going to show you output for both uh, vegetation module and hill slope. Okay, so vegetation, that H value is still the two times the tree height. For hill slope, that threshold angle, okay, so the, the adjacent hill slope angle that's needed before um, the hill slope module even kicks in is uh, 20%, and this is the kind of out of the box um, parameter value for RIP set. And then data sources, uh, channel topography, vegetation, kind of all um, coarse and publicly available data. So we ran this for two sub watersheds uh, within the Eel River watershed. Uh, the first, Grizzly Creek. Okay, and so what you see here is the output for both vegetation and hill slope, vegetation in green hill slope in brown. Okay, so let's zoom in on one area and get a little bit more detail. So as you can see, vegetation um, functional width is wide and essentially, you know, kind of uniform throughout. This is a very um, vegetated uh, watershed, um, a lot of redwood trees. Okay, so that's why these functional widths are so wide for vegetation. And then you see these brown areas, okay, these are the areas where the hill slope module kicked in. So the wide areas where our channels with the adjacent hill slope angle is very high, so much greater than 20%. That's why there's a lot of width. And then these kind of thin brown areas are, um, are these channel reaches where the adjacent hill slope angle is, is much less than 20%. Okay. So that's Grizzly Creek, and we also ran in the same kind of same uh, part of the Eel Creek watershed. We ran it for Sproul Creek. So kind of similar results, you know, wide functional riparian width with the vegetation module throughout, and then these little blobs of brown where the hill slope module kicked in. So doing the same thing with the output as we did for the Santa Rosa Plain, we came up with this 
plot, okay, percent total channel length, the same width classes, and the colors represent dark green as grizzly, and then the light green as sprout. And so we see a much different story here, right, compared to the Santa Rosa Plain that's highly impacted, and most of the functional width was down here for the vegetation module. Here in Humboldt County, most of the functional width is up here in the greater than 100, so we can say that over 80% of the channels in these two sub-watersheds have a fully functional riparian zone. This so is just some, some things you can do with the output from this. So application number three is now um, riparian area planning down in the Lagunitas Creek watershed. Okay, this is um, some work that we did with Marin County to help them with riparian planning um, in the San Geronimo Creek, which is a major sub-watershed for Lagunitas. And this can be uh, thought of as uh, looking at existing functional riparian width uh, for an impacted watershed. Not as impacted as Santa Rosa Plain, but, but impacted nonetheless. So where we are in the world, we're in county. Variable values, okay, vegetation and hill slope parameters, the same as you've seen before. But now, in this example, we're looking at veg, vegetation, hill slope, and high con. Okay, so it's important to know that for the high con module, the flooding extent that uh, we looked at is the, the 10 to 50 year flooding extent. Okay. Now, data sources, it's kind of important to, to park here for a second. The channel network and vegetation uh, publicly accessible, a kind of coarse scale, but the topography we used was uh, Marin County one meter LIDAR. Okay, so it's important to know that for the HICON module, to run HICON, LIDAR is necessary. HICON cannot be run with kind of coarse 10 meter USGS DEM. One meter LIDAR is needed. And so that's why that's what we used here. And then we also, to run HICON, need roughness information. Um, and that was obtained from kind of literature values, looking at air photos and coming up with estimates from the literature as well as for the channel, um, having particle size-based estimates for roughness. So on the right here, what we see is our output. So again, vegetation and hill slope shown in green and brown. Um, and, and what we see here, sites one, two, and three, is the places where we ran HICON. So it's interesting to note, kind of just blurring your eyes and looking at the hill slope output, all of these brown areas in, in these headwater channels, okay? so. That's kind of important to note because in this watershed in Lagunitas, right, this is one of the last holdouts for a, a quasi-healthy coho population, and these low-order channels are where a lot of the spawning gravel comes from. So there's a lot of interest in protecting um, these low-order channels, and the hill slope module output really shows these kind of steep areas, which are um, the source areas for spawning gravel. So what I want to focus on in this application is the HICON module output. So Let's look at what we, uh, what the HICON module showed for site one. Here's a zoom in of that area. And so what we have here is the, um, essentially the, the map output of what HICON gives you. So what you do is you tell the HICON module where you are. So that's this location right here. You say, HICON, this is where I am. <coughs> give it the channel network, you give it the topo, and what it does is it it cuts a cross-section where you are as well as a site just upstream and just downstream, okay? And then you give it, for each one of those three cross-sections, you give it roughness information. And then what HICON does is does its simple computation, its simple hydraulic computation, and give you the flooding extent for the 10-year flood, which is shown here in these blue dots, and then the 50-year flood, which is shown here in the yellow dots. Okay, so I'm sure the first thing you notice here is that those blue dots and those yellow dots are kind of on top of each other. So what you can do is then keep working with the data uh, that HICON outputs and kind of get a sense on, you know, why you're seeing what you're seeing at your site. So if we look at this middle, at this middle cross-section and actually look at a cross-section view, okay, so this is going, this is actually from um, right bank to left bank, so going this away, um, you can see that, you're in the channel here, and HICON gives us the blue dots, the 10-year flood, and the yellow dots, the 50-year flood. They're right on top of each other, okay? So this is because it's a really incised channel. And that's one of the things that we're also able to do with the HICON module is get a sense on channel um, incision, okay? So the HICON module can be used to kind of tell you how far out in the floodplain your flooding is, but it also can help you in these highly impacted watersheds give you a good uh, indication on how incised your channel is. Okay, so 
high-level overview on what you can do with HiCon and, uh, excuse me, with RIPSET. And now just to kind of walk through uh, the products associated with RIPSET. So the tool was released uh, about a year ago. And so users can now go to the SFDI website and download the tool and instructions. Okay, so here are the things that you can get. The tool, which is a GIS ARC tool and an Excel macro. Okay, so hill slope and vegetation modules are all, uh, are all run in GIS. But the HiCon module starts in GIS, goes into Excel, and then goes back into GIS. So there's two pieces to rip set. Um, there's also a user manual, okay, and so this can walk the, this walks the user through uh, information about how the user opens up the tool, um, information about the tool logic, and essentially the science behind the tool. It also provides uh, the user information on how um, the user can update input data. So, for instance, if you have a channel network and you have topo data that aren't lining up, if your topo data is much, is, has a, a finer resolution than your channel network data, um, the user manual provides some guidance on how the user can update the channel network. And then the user manual also um, helps the user understand the output that's being generated and gives some advice on how to compile and synthesize the output into summary graphics. Um, the user can also uh, download um, information about uh, the science behind RIPSA. Okay, we have some information um, about the literature that we used to, to develop the science that underpins the tool. Um, and then there's also some supporting documentation on how we developed the tool and the, uh, the, the validation sites that we visited and the validation data that we collected to develop the modules, uh, the HiCon module in particular. So this is the website where the user can go, um, sfei.org, projects, RIPSET, and the user can um, download all of these things there. And I'll pop that up here again at the end, so don't worry if you missed it. So next steps, um, RIPSET is a, is a complete tool, a really powerful tool, but it by no means is the end. And there's many things that we want to keep doing to continue to develop the tool. So the first is to continue developing our existing modules. Um, so we, for the HiCon module in particular, we validated um, the module and developed parameter values based on information collected in the North Bay, but um, we know it's important to actually look at watersheds throughout the state to come up with um, parameter values that are suitable for different environments. So continuing to um, validate the tool throughout the state would be very useful. Um, and then we also have our sites set on um, reworking the HiCon module so that it, it can be used for large watershed areas, so that it basically can be used in the same way that vegetation and hill slope modules are used. Um, and then we want to develop additional modules, okay? So we've been discussing this idea with, um, with uh, regional boards as well as the state board and other uh, partners to come up with some ideas on what the, the highest priorities for additional modules would be. Um, and we've been hearing things about a module that's focused explicitly on the degree of in-channel incision. Uh, like I mentioned, the HiCon module can do that now, but there could be some simple updates done to that module to make it really focused um, purely on answering channel incision questions. Um, next is the degree of stream shading and thermal loading. Um, you know, there's some opportunities there to, to develop this, uh, to develop a module that's specifically geared towards understanding how vegetation affects um, water temperature. And then developing a module that's associated with the functional width um, related to habitat. Okay, that's really kind of the final frontier here. Um, as you may have noticed, the functional, you know, the functions that I mentioned earlier were you know, uh, shading, bank stability, large woody debris, flood storage, but habitat was not explicitly mentioned because the functional widths associated with habitat are extremely species dependent, okay? So that's a lot of work would go into developing a module that's, that's related um, to just habitat. And so that's um, something that we have our sites set on as well in the near future. Um, so that's the high-level overview. Um, I definitely appreciate you all signing into this webinar, and, and I think we have a few minutes here uh, for questions, so I'll be happy to answer um, any questions you may have. And the website that you can go to to download the tool is up here, um, so I encourage you to go there and, and play around, and, and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Uh, my contact information is on the website. All guests have been unmuted. Okay, then thank you very much, Scott. I think Participants could uh, ask a question now, even from the phone. Is there a question from the phone line? Or we go to the room? 
For those of us that can't see the the website, can can that be given to us somehow? Oh, sorry. Yeah, for sure. So the website is um, sfei.org um, slash projects slash ripset. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, there's actually been one question out from the chat. The question is, have you incorporated stream channel gradient and width as a part of functional riparian zone width determination? Yes. Yeah, so I guess maybe the, the, just to quickly get into the mechanics of, of the modules, both all three modules, hill slope, vegetation, and um, HICON, give a functional width based on kind of distance from the channel edge. So, so the, the functional width starts at the, the delineation of the channel edge. So it's in, I think you know the width is incorporated there. Channel slope is incorporated in uh, the HICON module. That's part of um, the computation or that, that's part of the Manning's equation computation? I, I have a question. Um, okay. For the ICON model, how do you get the symmetry? Uh, are you using green LIDAR? Or you, I mean, I think probably most of these places have near infrared LIDAR. Are you going out and surveying cross-sections for that? I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Or, I'm sorry, let me go closer. For the HICON model, how are you getting the actual bisymmetry of the channel from the LIDAR? Assuming that this is probably near infrared LIDAR, are you going out and actually surveying these cross sections that you're computing Manning's yeah. on or extracting them from the, the DEM? Good question. So, and, and that was actually part of our validation in the North Bay. We um, used the Marin County one meter LIDAR. So the first thing we did is took that LIDAR and then, you know, cut cross sections at at our, at our um, validation sites. And so then after we cut those cross sections, we actually went out there and surveyed cross sections to essentially check the LIDAR to see how well it was performing and found that for Marin County anyway, that LIDAR was, um, you know, the, the field and the, the LIDAR results were very close. But that said, you know, LIDAR is very place specific, so all LIDAR is not created equal. So, you know, it might be different in different counties, but. Um, but that was our approach to try to help, you know, kind of validate uh, or at least, you know, get a sense on how well the LIDAR could or how trustworthy the LIDAR was to actually generate the answers that we needed. Okay. There's uh, another question uh, from the chat. It is, okay. do, do you see there being a difference in output in Southern California and more alluvial-based systems? Do I see there being a difference? Um, I do, for sure. I mean, you know, the vegetation, the vegetation module in particular, like I said, it's you know uses vegetation height and uses calvege. So, for instance, what we looked at up in Humboldt County, you know, a, a subwatershed that's covered in redwood trees is going to have a different functional width in the vegetation module than looking in you know San Diego County and looking at a you know a braided channel that's got you know that's bordered by cottonwoods. Um, so that's, you know, maybe what I was trying to allude to there and, and the, kind of what the next frontier for RIPSET is, is to, to do just that, is to kind of march around the state and go to these different environments and make sure that the parameters that we are using in RIPSET, um, we have the right parameter values. And we even have the right parameters to, to accurately capture functional width, whether you're in Humboldt County or whether you're in San Diego County. Okay, there's uh, one last question from the chat. Uh, that is, what is the status of the shade module? Uh, Region 1 uh, water board staff is currently developing a GIS-based yeah. shade model. We hope to include uh, this, this as a module in RIPSET. Yes. So that's, that, that's the state of it. I guess the state of it is that we, um, right as we were finishing up RIPSET development about a year ago, started talking with um, Region 1 folks to, to incorporate what they had already done into RIPSET as a module. Um, we just need to really kind of get back on that conversation and, and make sure that 
you know, we're kind of moving along to actually get that done. But the, it's on me, I'll say, to, get to kind of circle back to Region 1 and, and you know, keep working on that. Yes. One more quick question. Possibly two, but the, the first one was related to a question that was just asked. You showed a horizontal bar chart for Central Rosa Plain showing natural versus unnatural. Yeah. Um, how do you account for, is that something that a user is going in and manually assigning? How would you account for, say, High Sierra, there's very little vegetation versus Santa Rosa, where there's vegetation, but that's not natural there? Right, so the natural versus unnatural, that was basically a designation on whether the channel, you know, it was a natural channel or it was, um, you know, a, a drainage ditch for agriculture or other purposes. So m my sense is that when, um, when we ran that mod, when we ran uh, the vegetation module for the Santa Rosa Plain, either SFEI or you know a partner had designated each channel whether it was you know quote unquote natural or unnatural, and that's how we were able to segregate the data um, that right, way. So it's going to be a function of you know the channel attribute data that you have. Yeah, I, and one more question for Manning's. Have you run a sensitivity analysis? I'm wondering if you have to go out and actually do pebble counts or you can put an estimate. Does it change significantly if you change it by 0.1 or 0.05? Yeah, it, it, so I guess just the, the, the first thing to know for Manning's equation is extremely sensitive to roughness and slope. So, um, you know, we did some sensitivity analyses on, on how that would change our, our answers. So what we were able to do at the sites that we um, that we picked in the field in the North Bay, our validation sites, they were all gauged sites. So what we were able to do was recreate the USGS rating curve with Manning's equation, and Manning's N was our knob that we would turn to see how close we were getting to, to be able to kind of recreate the USGS's rating curve. Um, so, you know, all that said, we, you know, if you have a gauged site, um, you're kind of, you know, we were doing well because we were able to kind of match our results to reality. But, you know, Manning's end is such, there's so many different ways to estimate Manning's end, and everyone's got kind of a different, you know, a different understanding on how to estimate Manning's end. So, you know, I think it just kind of comes down to your output is only going to be as good as your, in, your input. And so if your Manning's end estimate going in is, has a high degree of uncertainty, then your output is going to have that same high degree of uncertainty. Um, so. Very quickly. Yeah, just one more very quick question, and we'll end. Okay, so my question is about uh, tree height and uh, vegetation loads. And I like to know the logic behind selecting tree height as a parameter for that mode. Right. So, I guess I guess the answer is you know the literature that. The literature is basically saying that um, for functions associated with, you know, large woody debris, shading, even filtration, you know, there's several, there, there's several studies now that have basically pointed to the fact that, you know, for um, forests like we have here in Northern California, um, two tree heights kind of gets you those functions. Anything more than two tree heights it is desirable. That's what you want. But in terms of the functions associated with shading, filtration, large wooded debris, it's really you know, the two tree height, um, the two tree height width. So that's why, just focusing on those functions, that's why we used that that H value, and then for the out of the box parameterization, kind of the the two mature tree height to be that H value. Does that does that answer your question? Thank you for the excellent presentation, and thank you all for participating. Okay, we'll see you next month, April 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.